Can I start? Should I start now? Uh, yeah, let's start. Okay. So I'll share the presentation. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, as uh, Bowen said, the, the today lecture will be about uh, soft robots, and uh, uh, I will start with uh, some uh, uh, motivational aspects, uh, and then I will move to the definition and the classification of soft robots, uh, and we'll conclude with some example of soft robots related to our research activity in uh, Professor Sue's lab. And in the bottom right, you can find my contact. Uh, so I put my email, you can reach me out uh, if you have any question uh, about the today presentation. So uh, <clears throat> I, I would like to start with uh, uh, a bit of uh, history of robotics. The modern uh, concept of uh, a robot was developed with the onset of the Industrial Revolution and uh, uh, it referred to the automatic uh, operation of uh, programmable machinery. Uh, this uh, individual is uh, uh, Animate, the, the very first industrial robot that was installed for the first time on an assembly line in 1961. So the, the first uses of uh, modern robots were in factories as industrial robots. And uh, since then, for many years, ro robots have been designed as fixed machines meant to perform uh, repetitive tasks in well-structured environments where uh, uh, business requirements emphasize factors like uh, speed and precision. So uh, this operating condition translated into a, a very specific architecture made by uh, made of uh, rigid links whose, uh, whose motions are concentrated in a, a small number of joints. And uh, <clears throat> due to uh, large masses moving at high speed, these robots can produce uh, huge forces and entering whatever and whoever force in their uh, workspace. Uh, and the, for this reason, uh, for, for the sake of safety, they are usually confined in, uh, in uh, protected areas, uh, enclosed by some cages like this. But, uh, uh, but uh, today we have a, a new concept of a robot. Uh, we, we aim at building robots that uh, uh, that are able to live among us, that uh, uh, can collaborate with us, and uh, that can help us in everyday tasks, not only for manufacturing purposes. So, um, but but uh, but the, the surrounding world is not uh, as structured as a factory. It is full of uh, uncertainties. So new challenges uh, uh, have to be faced for uh, this. Uh, for this uh, task. And in this new uh, scenario, the robot uh, cannot rely anymore on a perfect knowledge of uh, its environment uh, uh, because a small variation from the expected uh, condition can, can produce uh, failing results of the program and movement. As you can see in these two kinds of application related to uh, manipulation of a small cube or uh, locomotion. <clears throat> and uh, to overcome these uh, uh, shortcomings, uh, a useful uh, inspiration comes from nature. Uh, uh, animals, uh, in fact, exploit uh, uh, soft structure to move uh, effectively in complex natural environments. And the animal world is characterized by a prevalence of soft materials. The majority of animals are soft bodied, and, and even animals with stiff endoskeletons are mainly composed of soft tissues. 
For example, the human uh, skeleton typically uh, contributes uh, only 11% of the body mass of an adult male. So this, uh, all this consideration uh, constitute the basis of uh, soft robotics. Uh, it is a new branch of uh, robotics that uh, uh, has been emerging quickly in the last few years, as you can see from the clearly from the from this trend in the in the number of publication on the top left oh, that shows an exponential growth of uh, uh, publication. And uh, uh, to figure out this uh, understanding uh, uh, breakthrough, uh, it is worth mentioning also that. Uh, for instance, the journal Soft Robotics was founded early in the 2014 and has soon become one of the leading uh, uh, robotics uh, uh, journal. Uh, but uh, but um, it is also a very recent field, uh, as highlighted by the fact that the first international conference on Soft Robotics was held only in 2018. and. Uh, I'm happy to mention, as an Italian, I'm also happy to mention that uh, it was uh, held in Italy for the first time. <clears throat> uh, okay, now let's uh, uh, move to the definition. What, uh, what do we, we do mean with uh, soft uh, robots? So you, you might be uh, familiar with uh, uh, Baymax. No? It is the most popular uh, soft uh, uh, robot, example of soft robot, as it is the character of the uh, Disney film Big Hero 6. Uh, he actually has a, a, an implantable body sustained by an inner mechanical skeleton and uh, is designed to serve as a personal uh, healthcare uh, provider companion. You know? uh, uh, actually, its concept was inspired by the research work uh, conducted by the professor Atkinson at the Carnegie Mellon University, where uh, University Robotics Institute, where they are uh, currently uh, working uh, to to build a, a, a like a Baymax robot. So, uh, but what do we mean with uh, soft? Uh, th there is not a, a, it's not simple to give a rigorous definition. So some works define soft robots in terms of the young modulus of material. So a systems that are primarily composed of materials with moduli in the range of soft biological tissues. Other definitions instead are based on durometer sure hardness scales, uh, which means, uh, uh, which, me which measures uh, the, um, the resistance of material to indentation. Uh, we uh, here we refer to the definition given by the Robosoft community, according to which soft robots are uh, robot uh, devices that can uh, actively interact with the environment and uh, can undergo large deformation relying on inherent or structural compliance. So this definition, uh, as you can see, is still uh, quite uh, general and uh, it embraces different categories of soft uh, uh, robots. For instance, a fundamental classification distinguishes between uh, uh, soft articulated where uh, compliance uh, is uh, uh, achieved at the level of the structure and soft material robots uh, that instead uh, rely on, uh, on uh, materials with intrinsic uh, deformability. So the first class uh, takes uh, its inspiration largely from uh, vertebrate musculoskeletal systems uh, and uh, refers to robot in which uh, compliance uh, is uh, concentrated mostly in the robot joints. Uh, instead, the other branch uh, is inspired by uh, the invertebrates and uh, aims at uh, 
at uh, building robots with uh, continuously flexible material so that uh, their combined behavior is uh, distributed throughout uh, the, their structure. <clears throat> and yeah, uh, considering the, the promising potential of, uh, of this field, uh, not only uh, academic research, but only a number of uh, startup and uh, established company have started programs in uh, soft robotics and, and already demonstrated some, uh, uh, some interesting opportunity, especially to address tasks in areas such as grasping, manipulation, locomotion, but, but also other, uh, other kind of applications like, uh, uh, like uh, human assistance, uh, rehabilitation, and uh, healthcare. And, uh, and in order to support and accelerate the development of soft robots, uh, also several open platforms have been created, uh, like uh, the Soft Robotics Toolkit, the Natural Machine Motion Initiative, and the Open Soft Machines, uh, where uh, you can find, uh, where, where a researcher can share their. Uh, ideas, models, and designs. So you can find uh, also useful resources uh, to build uh, your own uh, uh, soft uh, robots. <clears throat> but uh, uh, coming back to the reasons for the, for the outbreak of soft robots and to, and to their advantages, uh, these uh, uh, devices uh, allow to overcome the main shortcomings of traditional rigid robots. Thanks to their compliant behavior, they are able to absorb uh, impacts, so they are safe. They can uh, work shoulder to shoulder with uh, humans. And this is true both uh, uh, for uh, soft articulated robots, where the compliance uh, is achieved uh, through elastic elements in the joints, like the uh, figure reporting on the left, and uh, uh, also for soft body robots, where instead the uh, the compliance is embodied in the intrinsic deformability of the material. <clears throat> and the other biggest advantage of uh, 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 related to the softness is the uh, capability to adapt uh, to the environment, making uh, uh, soft uh, robots suitable for grasping a, a, wide, vari a wide range of uh, objects and uh, for navigating several kinds of terrains. And thanks, uh, uh, thanks to this property, uh, soft robots don't have to uh, calculate their movements uh, as precisely as uh, hard robots. Because part of, uh, uh, of this computation is done by their body. And uh, uh, the, this concept is, um, <clears throat> is uh, uh, related to the so-called morphological uh, computation. Uh, that is a key, a key concept uh, with, in, uh, in soft robotics. In other words, uh, thanks to um, a sort of embodied intelligence, control of uh, locomotion or grasping becomes much simpler because very little brain power is required uh, as uh, it is uh, mainly uh, distributed throughout the body. And, uh, and this, uh, uh, if you think, looks also pretty natural. Uh, uh, because if we, if we, uh, you consider, uh, for instance, that uh, uh, we don't have to be focused while uh, working or uh, grabbing an object, but uh, it is, uh, uh, it happens uh, naturally. <clears throat> okay, uh, to now to conclude, uh, let's see some uh, some example of uh, soft robots. So. <clears throat> Uh, there are um, th th this uh, here I reported only a few examples. Uh, they can span a wide range of uh, application, including, uh, for instance, biomimetics, like the two octopus uh, on the left, where the the one on top is uh, one of the first uh, uh, soft robots, while the one of the 
bottom is the first uh, fully autonomous and untethered uh, soft, uh, soft material robot where uh, it, it uh, features an, an internal microfluidic, uh, um, microfluidic uh, board uh, to, to control its, uh, its movements. So instead of the traditional uh, electronic uh, board, it has this, this uh, microfluidic uh, circuit. Other applications include the, <clears throat> include the, uh, the grasping and manipulation that uh, allow to, <clears throat> to handle uh, uh, many kinds of objects with uh, different uh, uh, shapes or also fragile uh, objects like uh, eggs uh, or fruit, vegetables. Uh, and also uh, delicate uh, animals like the jellyfish in the bottom uh, right figure. Uh, um, finally, other applications uh, include uh, inspection and exploration uh, of uh, unexplored, uh, unexplored uh, spaces or uh, also uh, rehabilitation and uh, assistance uh, like the uh, the globe uh, on the top uh, right figure. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, here I will focus on uh, uh, on uh, fluidic elastomer actuators that are uh, uh, related to uh, our research activity in the lab uh, added by Professor Su. Uh, these are uh, fiber reinforced uh, inflatable chambers that uh, can can be used to produce different uh, kind of motions such as uh, extension, contraction and uh, bending. And uh, let's see how they can be made. Uh, a simple uh, uh, chamber acts uh, like uh, any typical balloon so that uh, when inflated it uh, expands in all directions. If uh, instead of uh, uh, if uh, we uh, wrap the bladder with uh, uh, inextensible uh, fibers, uh, um, the, the bladder is uh, constrained uh, from uh, expanding radially, so that when inflated, it can only expand in the axial direction, obtaining uh, uh, an extending uh, actuator. In, if instead of winding uh, the fibers uh, in a circumferential direction, we wind uh, uh, them in a longitudinal uh, direction, what uh, we get is a contracting actuator. Uh, so that it uh, expands uh, uh, radially and uh, shortens uh, longitudinally. Uh, finally, if we add a uh, 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 a sheet of inextensible material to the to the extending actuator, uh, it uh, uh, prevents the actuator from expanding in the in the region of the of that sheet. Since uh, uh, and since one side expands actually and the one does not expand, the actuator uh, bends when uh, inflated. Uh, so, uh, it, uh, for instance, this kind of design is uh, usually exploited to realize uh, soft fingers. Uh, but the most popular type of uh, fluidic elastomer uh, actuator is the so-called Mackie-Ben actuator that was uh, designed for the first time in the 1960. Uh, and uh, it uh, uh, is made of uh, two main components. Uh, one is the uh, rubber or elastomer inner tube, and the other is the uh, double helix braided sheets, so that um, uh, when uh, uh, pressurized, uh, it uh, uh, contracts uh, longitudinally. Uh, Theoretically, a McKibben muscle can be uh, driven either by hydraulic or pneumatic uh, pressure. Um, 
uh, yeah, uh, again, uh, the the role of uh, the inner tube is uh, to provide the stability and uh, uh, the ballooning effect. So to uh, increase uh, its volume when uh, uh, inflated. Instead, the the braided sheet is, is responsible for uh, transforming the uh, circumferential stress due to the internal pressure uh, into a linear uh, contraction force. Uh, and uh, it is very popular because uh, uh, it, uh, uh, the McKibben muscle is very popular because it uh, uh, has uh, some property that uh, uh, are very similar uh, to uh, the, na the, the uh, natural uh, muscles, so it is uh, uh, often uh, called, uh, often used as an artificial muscle. Uh, and uh, for instance, uh, we in our lab also uh, uh, developed our own uh, uh, prototype. Uh, it has uh, several advantages like uh, high power density, uh, low cost, high reliability. Uh, yeah, it can uh, work also after uh, it is, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, after a, a, a forklift uh, passes through it, uh, through it. And, uh, and uh, finally, it also can uh, show a large, large contraction ratio. Uh, all, so all these uh, uh, characteristics make, make it uh, uh, suitable uh, for the implementation as an artificial muscle. And uh, yeah, for instance, uh, uh, in our lab, uh, um, uh, some, some uh, your colleagues of yours uh, developed uh, uh, an elbow exosuite with uh, uh, some specifications that uh, uh, make it very similar to the human uh, bicep. It can be used so for um, uh, some rehabilitation tasks or uh, uh, for prevention of musculoskeletal, uh, uh, musculoskeletal disease. <clears throat> uh, finally, uh, the last uh, the last uh, design I would like to show you today is the origami actuator. Uh, that uh, uh, yeah, origami, you know, is the the art of uh, folding the uh, folding paper, and uh, it can be uh, used to uh, produce also uh, very uh, high performance uh, actuate, soft actuators. Uh, so uh, it is uh, easy to manufacture because. Uh, we can uh, use a 3D printed uh, um, a skeleton wrapped by a, uh, a, a sealing skin. And uh, uh, once we uh, apply vacuum pressure with, within the skin, the actuator uh, contracts and uh, is able to exert uh, very high forces. <clears throat> so it is uh, it. Uh, as a very uh, high <clears throat> uh, force to weight ratio and uh, uh, we uh, other uh, another project uh, done uh, in the lab was uh, uh, an ankle exosuite based on uh, this kind of actuator so to assist uh, uh, dorsi, dorsi flexion of the ankle joint and uh, <clears throat> uh, it, it is uh, uh, not only easy uh, to manufacture, but uh, it can be also easily integrated in a uh, compact and uh, portable uh, uh, design. Uh, so for, uh, for mobile applications. Uh, and uh, its advantages include uh, low cost, uh, Lightweight and high force that uh, together uh, that together um, uh, means uh, high weight to <clears throat> high force to weight ratio and uh, uh, untethered. 
Okay, so with this, I conclude the uh, 30 minute presentation. I added some uh, uh, material for uh, further study of uh, those of you, of you who are uh, interested in this topic and uh, including uh, the videos for uh, uh, yeah, videos for uh, further uh, uh, to go into more details. Uh, okay. Uh, Bowen? Yep. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you for giving us this speech. Uh, please stay with us for another 30 minutes and we will have group four to give us a presentation also about software robotics. Uh, group four. Antonio, uh, can you please stop sharing the screen? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, group four. Is group four here? Yeah, we're here. Should be. Okay, great. Uh, can you please oh, can you please turn on your video, your cameras, yes. and please give us this uh, presentation of yours, please. And after your presentation, Dr. Dalilo will give us give some us. feedback. And I think you can share your screen, right? And also, we can hear you. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? No, no, I'm talking to Harrison. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Hello. Okay. Yeah, we, we can hear you now. All right. Uh, sorry about that. I my mic wasn't working before. Uh, I'm sharing it. Give me one sec. Oh, uh, can you see it? Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, should we present now? Yes, please. Um, uh, hello. Uh, this is our group, uh, group four, and we're gonna introduce about soft robots. Uh, we're gonna start uh, with the ethnics, and Richard's gonna take it away. Oh wait, uh, before we start, uh, these are the outlines. So we're gonna talk about the ethnics, soft robots, classification, tutor and untutor soft robot, challenges, application, and then future works. Richard. Yep. Thank you. Uh, so ethics of robotics are pretty, is a pretty simple concept. Don't do harm. Always try to do more with what you have. Don't try to leave something behind. Don't try to waste materials. Basically, whatever you think is bad, don't do it. But of course, this is just a general idea of robotics, and we're here for soft robots, as Penny's will take on the next slide. Thank you. So what is soft robot? Soft robot is a kind of robot that deals with the constructing robots. It draws a heavy reflection from our surrounding, like we can mention spider, lizard, or octopus as a soft robot. So how they are structured? They usually are three layer, the active layer, which is located at the bottom, the middle layer, which is strain layer, and the top layer, which is called traction surface. So some of them can pick up some sensitive stuff without crushing it, like they can pick up bread or tomato, and some of them are so light that they can walk on the water like some kind of insect. Uh, and due to their structure, they are damage resistant. We can use... Uh, Next slide, please. So we can use soft robot to create a superior prosthetics for missing limbs, like we can make a, a hand for human, or we can do it, we can use it in a food industry and some kind of same area. So how we can make one? It's usually uh, contains two parts. These parts are mold um, soft material like silicone, 
we glue them to each other with a thin layer of flexible sheet and then we use CAD or other programming application to programming it and design it and then we use our 3D printer and then we have our soft robot. We can mention beanbucking and snapshot as a, some type of soft uh, robot. Beanbucking is like human muscles. It's rotated, it's rotated in a different direction. And as you can see in a picture, it can pick up uh, some sensitive, sensitive stuff like bread or as I said, tomato without crushing it. The next one is SnapPod. It's pressurized the entire robot and it's like a lizard. As you can see, it's like a lizard hand and we can make a human, uh, artificial human hand with this type of robot. Next, my group mate uh, Justin will talk about the threaded and untreated soft robot. Okay, so there are two more types of soft robotics, which are tethered and untethered robots. Soft robots that have a tether and don't have one respectively. They each have their own advantages and disadvantages. With tethered soft robots, the tether acts as a power supply for the robot and helps to enable propulsion and controls, which also helps to simplify the design process. The drawback of a tether is that the robot is then limited in its movement as it's restricted by the length of the tethers. With untethered soft robots, they're able to move more freely, but they had to be able to sustain themselves. Attaching an onboard control system would be very heavy and make the robot hard to move. Fortunately, they can be pre-programmed with tasks and directions to move on their own, thus removing the need for electronics and power sources on board. They're aided by SMPs, which are known as shape memory polymers, which help, uh, are materials that help remember their own original shape. They act like muscles to allow for the soft robot to adapt to its surroundings and geometrically reshape itself. A good example of an untethered robot would be the walking robot shown in diagram above. I mentioned one disadvantage of an untethered and a tethered soft robot. The Harrison will go further into the challenges and obstacles of soft robots in general. Uh, thank you, Justin. Um, so as we know, there are many obstacles that soft robots will encounter. Um, there are many, but th I believe that these are the most important uh, ones for the challenges that each soft robot will encounter. The first one um, is cost. As you see, uh, cost can be quite costly for the inventions of the soft robot. It can range from a dollar, which is a simple origami uh, kind of structure for soft robot for the beginning of the huge uh, complicated type of machinery for soft robots. And it can range all the way up to $120,000, as you can see on the bottom left corner, which is that uh, food, that uh, production industry, where they, um, the machine is grabbing small plastic material, um, not trying to damage it, and moving it to places as, as, as efficiently as possible. So as you can see, it can range from a dollar to $120,000. For the next one is, I believe it's material for what I believe is um, material because um, first, um, right now uh, in our um, uh, environment, we are more, we're stimulating of plastic change. We are, we believe that uh, plastic is harming the earth uh, way too much and severe. So we are finding an uh, alternative for uh, replacement of plastic. So we are, in other words, uh, finding other like some schools, uh, universities have already began this type, which is uh, Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon University. This will be further discussed uh, later on in the future works. And also the material uh, needs to be uh, deformable, uh, in other words, flexible. So it can reduce the chance of damaging once it, it gets hit by something or, yeah, hit by something. So less chance of breaking. So more resistance, so that's a better type of material. And the third one is miniaturized component. So we create more of a spacious area and more uh, machinery for more other soft robots and it can be easily be portable. So you don't have to carry such a soft robot for an advancement in your body. So we, so some miniaturized components could be like sensors, boards, motors, efficient controller, high torque, and with some high torque power supply. So with this being said, uh, with these small components and that can uh, work efficiently, this is a better investment in soft robot. And with all these inventions being made, marketing can be a huge issue for these new invention of soft robots because uh, 
both parties uh, for the producer and the inventing, the inventor uh, will both face this marketing issue because they don't know if this uh, product would be sold or like work properly. So depending on that, uh, it might be a fail or a huge success. So usually some people might not take the risk. So this will, marketing will cause a huge issue with the uh, marketing issues. And with all this being said, uh, Richard will start talking about the types of application of soft robots. All right, thank you. Uh, anyways, so soft robots can do a number of incredible things. Of course, they can do the normal stuff. They can build your house, they can build, they administrate medication. They can regain lost ability such as walking and lifting and a number of other things. But there are some of the more, the ones listed above are some of the more popular and more recent advancements in their field. The, the first being wearable robots, where they're kind of, if you, if you haven't seen before, there's kind of this viral video going around this 50 year old man lifting like a hundred pound box in a suit. It, it's kind of viral. It's kind of interesting to watch. It's maybe like a 15 second clip. If you haven't seen it, I suggest go take a look at it. It doesn't take much of your time, but it's pretty interesting to see how that happens. Prosthetics are kind of similar, but they're of course different. They are actually attached to you rather than just being able to remove. But they also do the same thing as wearable robots. They give you the ability to walk, they give you the ability to run, lift things, etc. Um, muscle robots are a form of origami, and that's what makes them so interesting. And what makes them so unique is that because they're so small and because they're, they're foldable like origami, they can lift things far more than, they, than you would think. Sometimes te as, mm, 10 times the amount they can, or just 10 times their own body weight, like an ant. It's pretty interesting. Climbable soft robots are good in bending, transporting, and they can also be used for emergency safety and rescue. They can also be specialized in maintaining tall buildings or structural integrity, or whether or not uh, skyscrapers or, or apartment buildings need repair. And because they're so snake-like, it kind of brings out this animalistic feel, and it's nice. Um, edible robots are kind of interesting. As their name would, as their name suggests, they're edible. They dissolve when they enter your body, and they're great at administering drugs and medication. So it's just a good idea to 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 have around. Um, but not all applications of, of, ro of soft robots have to necessarily help humans, as shown in my next slide. As you can see here, these are some of the applications of soft robots that don't necessarily help humans um, or directly help humans. The images on the left in red are of an octopus and a squid. They, see almost, they, they seem almost realistic and can mimic natural movements of the animal, and this kind of helps us explore the use of rudders and fins on aquatic vehicles. It also kind of helps us understand and explore the bottom of the ocean of our fear, because all you would have to do at this point is, is, uh, is survive the pressure of the ocean and then slap a camera on it. Uh, the one in the middle is a realistic fish created by James Puke of the in, from the University of Pennsylvania with the help of Robert Sherbert, or Shepard, my bad from the uh, Sibley School of Men Mechanical and Aerospace Engineer. And they created it in an attempt to recreate real life. As Mr. Shepard would put it, in nature we see how long organisms can operate while doing sophisticated tasks. Robots can't operate while doing, a lot, while doing feats for long periods of time. So they had mimicked real life organisms in an attempt to use it on our, our own vehicles to make them last longer. And my personal favorites, the two on the right in green, are both caterpillars. The one on the bottom is a caterpillar tread. And it's the idea that of, of being an all-terrain vehicle. I guess you could call it a, a caterpillar tread, like on a tank. It's, it's, it's pretty interesting. And the one on top is a caterpillar that's the size of your finger. But what's so interesting about it is that it only is attracted towards light. It will move towards light, whether it be artificial or natural. And while at first glance it seems kind of useless or, or not interesting because it's how small and how useless it is at, at first glance, it's quite interesting to think about how much our, our light sensors have come, how much technology has evolved. From being massive monitors that attract uh, and scan everything to something the thickness of your fingernail. 
But in my other slide, I had not gone into details about wearable robots because Ramazon will take it on from there. Um, okay. One direct application of soft robots are wearable robots that are uh, designed after the shape and function of the human body. So these robots augment the human capacity by assisting us in simple tasks that we struggle to perform or are too lazy to do, to do as in the case with the, the glove that helps rehabilitate people uh, who have nerve damage or some injury with their hand that they, where the nurses need to help them close and open their hand to sustain the ability to use their, uh, use their hands. Or um, also, for example, they help people that work in harsh environments such as the military or people who need assistance lifting heavy objects like uh, in the warehouse. Here's what I found. Um, so they use, they're used for rehabilitation for people who can't function, they use their limbs or hands. Also some challenges that uh, we encounter, encounter when making these soft robots is customizing them to fit specific people because every person has different dimensions uh, that the variable robots need to be adjusted to, for them to function uh, properly. And uh, we also need to find better materials to lighten the power supplies and extend the, 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 their operation and uh, make it comfortable for the user, basically. And finally, some other applications include where, um, them being used in extreme temperatures or pressures, uh, and for example, also using them in, uh, for disarming uh, mines and et cetera. So now uh, Mohammed will go over the future works. All right. As, as like uh, any project uh, must have a future work and the producer uh, of it must develop a world and needs uh, to use in uh, for 10 or 15 year, more years. They're not gonna just use it for one year because uh, this kind of robots needs more functions and, and they have like uh, many tasks. So like they were not gonna use it for one or two years. Uh, of course, they're gonna develop it to use it for 10 or 15 years. And also based on many articles about the future work of the robot, um, uh, the scientists said that they're gonna create it uh, in need and to help the human body in some dangerous situations, uh, like preventing the natural disasters and also helping the army in transferring uh, some dangerous materials like bombs and grenades. And also like Richard mentioned before about the, the video that the, the robot is lifting uh, a big mass of box. Um, that also like one of the function of the soft robots that like the scientists like they want to develop it. And also uh, they want to they want to add uh, that the robot can gain and collect data that the human body can do it and also can save it. Uh, also, the scientists are not showing the future work in the body or the movement uh, only in the soft robots. Uh, and how flexible it's gonna be, but also they are showing the task that the human can do it, as well as the robot. Um, uh, there is some future work about the soft robot materials that Harrison is going to present. Thank you. Um, so this is the future work for materials. As I mentioned before, about the about colleagues in Carnegie Mellon University, this material is soft and stretchy, and yes, it may contain some soft rubber that is some that is plastic but it's not fully made of plastic all the way so it, it's trying to prevent the way of it's trying to get into the eco-friendly so there's some metal uh, soft rubber and some shape memory material as you can see in the image below that it, the material is working uh perfectly and in the second one it shows that there is some holes in it but the material shows that uh, the function is still working even though there are some bits of damage, um, it, it is still functioning, which shows that um, the idea of resistance to a bit of damage, it's very positive in a good way. And, but like severe damage is detected, so it's finding a way to heal. But it's, as you can see, that, that, that damage is really severe. So if it doesn't work, it it's, didn't work. But like, as you can see, like little damages, it's still um, 
allow it to work. So with this great stability of resistance towards uh, simple damage, uh, we are heading the right way for soft robots because for soft robot to be able to take a little damage and still be able to function, it's all right because uh, the food industry or getting or like for upgrading for advancement for your uh, human parts, um, it, it will still allow you to get where you want until you get it fixed. So this is a great material that is being made currently. And Justin will summarize the ideas of soft robots. Okay, to review, a soft robot is the robot that takes inspiration from the movements and functions of living organisms, which allow for humans to design robots that are more biofriendly and adaptable to change in their surroundings. Soft robots have many different applications, such as interaction between humans and machines, self-exploration of movement, medical and surgical applications, such as artificial human parts, or about robots like prosthetics, etc. Soft robots are no ordinary robots. They're designed with limitless potential and have been shown to produce results. It has been used in the food industry, the medical industry, production industry, and so much more. While soft robots is in the oldest view of robots, it continues to grow and be developed with time to be more successful, useful, and refined for the future. Uh, thank you for your attention and our resources will be listed right here. Thank you very much, Paul. This thank is you. very, thank you. This is a very nice presentation, a very, inspiration, a very inspirational. Uh, I think this is a pretty good uh, presentation. Antonio, do you have anything to talk about this yeah, presentation? I agree, it's a, a nice uh, presentation, thank you. Uh, for your work. Uh, one thing that uh, I think should be added uh, is uh, uh, some limitations of soft robots because uh, uh, of course uh, uh, they are good for many things but uh, have also some uh, limitations so they are not expected to uh, totally replace uh, traditional uh, rigid robots but uh, uh, to supplement them. No? Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think uh, this could be one uh, opportunity to uh, improve uh, even more the presentation. So just uh, uh, providing uh, some uh, limitation. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, so about the homework, this kind of presentation, this is very, uh, very good one, an excellent one. Uh, so for the future, this presentation will be just as this one. And so about the homework, about the homework one, you need to upload both the PPT file and the video. So team four, please upload your uh, slideshow to the link as you uh, uploaded your video. And also I think there is a team missing. Is that team two? You haven't uploaded your video yet and your slide yet. Please do so as soon as possible. And now let's talk about the homework two. Let me, okay. All right, let me share the screen. Okay, so here is for the homework two, it's about the actuator. You will read three papers and watch two re related videos. And the rest of it would be just like this homework one. Remember the due date is October tw the 12th. You need to present on October 12th. So you will at least submit your homework a day before that. And the detailed information and the tasks you can find in this uh, slide. And also, oh, sorry. You can find the homework to information in this folder. 
with the three papers we've already got there for you. Um, please remember to include your team number inside your submission files so that we would know who, ha who has uploaded their files, who hasn't. And is there any questions for us about this homework? Uh, I only see homework one. Is there a link? Yeah, I think. Off? Let me see. Can I see the homework too now? Professor, if the if it's uploaded on the Dropbox link uh, on the homework it, by one person, it's good enough, right? Or should everyone uh, upload it themselves? Yeah, yeah. You just need to upload once for your team. You don't need to re-upload it. Like mm -hmm. you, you don't need to upload it for everyone. You just uh, the the team leader. I think you've already chosen a team leader, right? Yeah, yeah. And also for the Blackboard. Uh, my teammate was saying that there's another submission request. Uh, you don't need to worry about that. You just uh, go through the link that it will be fine. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I don't see it yet. I don't. Is there a way for you to? Yeah. Drop and then. Put just it in? wait a second. Let me share. The All right. Link. And, and also, so, um, sorry, sorry to put it. Yeah, but, yeah it's uh, okay. My email, I believe you guys emailed me uh, the wrong email, so I haven't received any uh, email lately. Okay. I just wrote in the chat right now, so. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Uh, so this HCH O W O one is that you? Oh uh, yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. We'll add that to the email list. Thank you for giving us this information. And so there are two links I just shared with you guys. The first one would be the software robots, the lecture slide we just had with uh, Dr. Dalilo. The second one would be the homework two file, the homework two folders. Is there any questions about this presentation and homework? Uh, we're working with the same groups, right? Yeah, you're still working with the same group. And each group will get their chance to give this presentation. So don't worry about that. If there's no other questions, let's watch two videos that Antonio would like to share with us. Sorry, just wait a second. password. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for coming. I'm excited to tell you today about a new area in the field of robotics, which is known as, as soft robots. And what I'm going to try to communicate in the talk today is about uh, what soft robots are, give some examples of, of research on these soft robots from my laboratory, and uh, as the title says, why they're for humanity, how they can help with our, our safety, our health, and our quality of life. So first of all, let me just do a little bit of an introduction to, to what soft robots are. Uh, this shows a kind of spectrum from mostly stiff robots that have a few compliant elements. Uh, the one on the left, possibly you've seen before, that comes from a Stanford uh, professor in my department, Mark Kakoski, who was one of the first to recognize that robots could take inspiration from animal biology and use some flexibility in their joints to improve their natural dynamics. And so he made robots that can run fast like cockroaches, whether or not that sounds good to you <laughs> may depend on how you feel about cockroaches, uh, but nonetheless, it created some of the, the fastest small robots in the world that could be used for, uh, for surveillance and, and, and checking out unknown areas. All the way to the other end of the spectrum to something that was just published last year called the Octobot, which is entirely soft. So everything in it is soft, even the, the circuitry of it is soft, and it's chemical reactions and fluids within the body of this soft robot that even um, controlling cause it to move. Uh, I think the challenge of some of these very, very soft robots is uh, they're sort of cool from a scientific perspective, but all this Octobot really does is kind of it, move a little bit. It doesn't really uh, do anything in the environment, and we don't really have a way for it to help people. And so um, along the spectrum of soft robots, I'm going to be showing you some examples of several projects from my lab, um, which have varying levels of softness, but are all designed to solve real-world problems uh, and, and affect humanity. And so these examples are as follows. The first one is going to be a, a hands-on simulator, uh, originally designed for medical simulation, but could also be used in other applications. And here it's about haptics. Haptics means the sense of touch, and we're trying to build devices that feel like real-world objects, even though they're artificial. And the second project is flexible medical robots that are designed to be just right to go through the body of a specific patient to be as minimally invasive as possible. And then the last one is about some new soft robots. These are very recent, just published for the first time this summer, about robots that effectively grow out of their tip and um, can grow like vines or plants and have some really interesting uh, properties and, and potential applications. And I'll also try to highlight for each of these some of the awesome students uh, that have contributed to these projects. Um, so first of all, I'm going to talk about this, this hands-on haptic simulation. And the reason why we would like haptic simulation in medicine is so that if someone is training to be a doctor, they can practice not on you, the patient, initially, but they can practice in some kind of virtual world. Now, there exist on the right-hand side these virtual environments that you can kind of poke at through a stick and get force feedback, and those can be very realistic but the interaction is limited to poking at something with a stick. On the other hand, you have on the left side these mannequins, which you can really get this hands-on training. If you want to learn how to palpate or do certain kinds of procedures, it's very natural, but these mannequins are static. We can't change the way that they feel for different pathologies, and so we're, we are, are missing something in between these two, and we'd like to have the best of both worlds. Another thing to consider when we're thinking about designing these haptic or touch feedback devices is that our sense of touch is really complicated. One way to, to simplify it or to think about it as two major categories is to say that we have force feedback devices. These are uh, devices that push on your arms or your hands and you feel large scale motions or forces in your body uh, and typically these are done by poking through a stick. Uh, on the other hand, there's cutaneous or tactile devices which stimulate the skin. And this is often achieved through an array of little pins or other tiny motors or actuators that can provide distributed information on the skin. And it's this combination of what you feel in your skin and what you feel in your, in your muscles and tendons and your joints that all together give, up our, give our perception of the world around us and also of our, of our own bodies. And so ideally, you'd like the best of both worlds here. You'd like to have these immersive, realistic medical simulations. And uh, while there are many haptic devices that have been designed, there's this new concept of something called active surfaces. 
This is surfaces that can change their shape and mechanical properties, and we wanted to try to do this for medical simulation. So the idea is not to build an entire mannequin out of this stuff, because that's a lot of motors and it's very expensive, but that you have a little block of material that can change its shape and mechanical properties, but the user, the trainee, would see a visual display of a patient, like the one shown at right, and their hand is being used to palpate and look, for example, for a hard lump in soft tissue that might indicate cancer. And in this case, the user can reach out the hand, the robot can move the block underneath the hand, and then the device can reconfigure itself to feel a certain way. And then if you want to touch a different part of the patient, it could move over there and reconfigure itself so it feels appropriately. So that's, that's the dream for how this all works together. I'm going to focus mostly on just the reconfigurable device itself and how this works. So this is an example of one of the very first devices that we built. It's a little four-cell array, and each cell can change both its shape and mechanical properties. In this case, we're trying to simulate what um, the surface of organs and the surface of the skin feels, so it's basically kind of a soft, lumpy environment, which matches well to the soft robotic technology that we have. And the way that it works is um, actually pretty simple. The way that it balloons up is by air pressure being applied from below. We can also uh, pin certain nodes in between these cells, and that can help pull it down and help us control shape. But the real sort of secret in this device is that to make things hard or soft, we have these silicone chambers that are filled with coffee grounds. So why coffee grounds? <laughs> so if you've been shopping at the grocery store and you buy vacuum-packed coffee grounds, you know that the package is really hard and stiff. But if you open up the bag and mix your finger around in it, of course, it's very soft and, and movable. So the vacuum is actually kind of locking the coffee grounds together and changing it from very soft to very stiff. So by vacuuming the air out of the chambers in the device, we can actually make it hard or soft. And there are many other smart materials that could be used, but coffee grounds were readily available in our research lab, and uh, the graduate students found that to actually be very effective material for doing this kind of jamming behavior. So in order to figure out, once we knew that this approach would work, we wanted to say, do, can we have a simulator that it would allow us to, to figure out how many cells we would need to create certain types of display? So we're able to say, if we have different shapes of cells and different combinations of them, can we come up with algorithms to create the shapes that we want? And we can test this all in a virtual environment before we build the devices. And that's important because building the devices is actually a huge pain. Uh, and this picture I show not to be proud of what a mess it is to actually build a large device with lots of cells in it, but to actually show that this is one of the main challenges of soft robotics right now, in that if you want to have a bunch of chambers, each of which can be changing its mechanical properties and changing its shape, we need to be able to get beyond this kind of curse of dimensionality of all the different pneumatic lines and cables and, and actuators that are present. So uh, I always promised my PhD student I would show the slides. Everybody knows how hard he worked <laughs> to build this system. And uh, in, in the end, although it, it is a mess to build, you can actually have a very effective uh, system in the end. So the way my machine sound, turn it off. Um, so this is a 100-cell array, which the, the, the guts of it were shown in the previous slide. And every one of the cells has these properties that I discussed earlier, where you can change the shape and the mechanical properties. And in this case, uh, for some reason, the conference we were submitting to wanted videos that, that all share the property of having a rubber ducky in it. So that is why it's going in the shape of a rubber duck. And uh, there could, could have been any shape. But the idea is that we, we measure it with one of these uh, 3D Connect cameras that you can get with your Microsoft PlayStation. We use that visual information and depth information for feedback, and then we control the device to be in that shape. And simultaneously, we can control it to be hard or soft in different locations. Ultimately, though, for creating any general shape, this is somewhat disappointing. We could actually do a pretty good job of recreating the abdomen and, and lumps and bumps in that area. But now if you want to think bigger about creating any shape, any mechanical property, this kind of 2.5D, uh, that is an XY plane that can go up and down, this kind of array of cells, 
isn't necessarily the optimal way to go. And you can see it doesn't really create a duck um, very faithfully, since duck is really 3D and not a 2.5D object. So the thing that we're working on now as we push forward with this project is really thinking about 3D shapes. So this is actually a heart model here. And the idea is that we can simulate hearts with different pathologies, an enlarged heart, a heart with muscle weakness, and so it has softness in certain areas. And then rather than trying to arbitrarily have some set array of, of, of cells that would require all of the complexity that I showed earlier, instead we can simplify this by saying we're going to have an algorithm where there's a few specific target shapes that we want to hit and we want to design the optimal device to start with that can be morphed into those different target shapes and not any arbitrary shape. And that actually really simplifies the design, makes it more elegant, and actually makes it something that could be a commercial product. So this is something we actually collaborated with on, on a company to work on medical simulation. But I think this concept of, of objects that change their shape and mechanical property have a lot of other interesting applications. These include um, interesting human-computer interaction scenarios. So one example might be in consumer products. So let's say you wanted to buy a sneaker, and you wanted to get an idea of what its shape and size were other than just seeing it on a screen on your computer, or even in a VR environment where you're limited to visual interaction. So if you had such a device on your desktop, it could pop into the shape of that shoe. And then you might say, well, I don't like the shape of the toe box. I want to push it down, and I want to change its shape a bit. Well, that manipulation could then be recorded, sent back to the computer, even be sent back to the manufacturer who then might be able to create for you an ideal custom shoe that matches the way that, that you shaped it. So there are a lot of different concepts here for how this could be used, but the idea of a changeable project or digital clay, I think, is one of the, the dreams of, of engineering in general. And thinking at this from a perspective of, you know, what are the techniques and algorithms that you could use to make these changeable objects are going to start to get us there. At the moment, mechanically, practically, we can do this at the macro scale, but with new developments in MEMS and new actuation technologies and smart actuators in particular, there is the possibility to make something that's more like a truly changeable product a reality in the future. So that is one kind of soft robot, and it's a haptic or touch feedback device. I want to tell you now about a very different type of soft robot. It's not soft in the sort of stretchable sense um, of the silicone rubber that was used in the previous part, but it's soft in that it's flexible, and it's designed to go inside the human body. And the idea here is that you would like to get uh, deep inside a patient's body in the most minimally invasive way possible. Now, robot-assisted surgery is not science fiction. Many of you probably know that there are commercial surgical robots. Hundreds of thousands of procedures are done every year. Uh, prostate surgery is actually the biggest application right now for surgical robots because it allows clinicians to do the procedure in a minimally invasive fashion while, uh, while causing less damage to the body. And these surgical robots have actually had a lot of benefit but they also have a lot of cost. And then there are patient populations that the robot cannot be used with. Small children, the tools are a little bit too large. And then there are sometimes obese patients or people with other shapes of bodies that they just can't find the right path for these straight line tools to get inside the body where we want to go. And by the way, I'll promise you that there are no gory pictures in this, <laughs> in this talk. I, I have my gory picture talk, but I decided to leave it out for the alumni <laughs> event. So our idea here is that it's um, not about uh, just designing the, the, the big robot that can really precisely move the tool to a particular location, but rather thinking about it from a patient-centered uh, perspective. So what we want to do is have a patient-specific design workflow where you have images of the patient, for example, from a CT scan, you build a 3D model of the inside of that patient, and then there's um, a surgeon design process. The surgeon could actually design the shape of the robot they want that would snake through the patient's body in the most minimally invasive way possible to reach the target without puncturing through other organs. Right? And then once the surgeon designs the robot that they want, they don't have to pick the motors or the bearings and the material, but they design the shape. And then we can fabricate it now using newer 3D printing technology that allows us to fabricate um, softer materials. And then we can actually 
drive it, attach it to a robot external to the body, and then drive this snake-like robot along the path that the surgeon designed it for. So there are many types of robots that can be used in surgery. And um, the specific type of robot that lends itself really, really well to this design methodology is called a concentric tube robot. And this was something developed um, quite a while ago, almost 10 years ago now, by a student of mine. And the way that it works is it uses a series of tubes, each tube being highly flexible. In this case, they're made out of nitinol, which is a super elastic material. And you put one tube inside the other, and you can put a third tube or a fourth tube or a fifth tube if you want. And you pre-curve those tubes. And so as they insert and spin with respect to each other, you can get this tentacle or snake-like behavior. And what that allows you to do is have a very thin kind of backbone to the robot and have all the motors and the parts that drive those tubes in and out and spin them keep those big motors outside the body. And that lets us have a really tiny instrument, which is very appropriate, for example, for the pediatric urologist here at Stanford that, that approached us about designing a new robot that got around the limitations of existing clinical robots. So this is not our, our doctor collaborator, but my graduate student, Tanya, um, using the 3D virtual reality environment where she's kind of immersed inside the patient's body, and she's designing the tubes. Uh, in fact, in this video, it's showing her designing the desired tubes outside the patient's body, and that's just because all of you really wouldn't be able to see what she was doing if she was really inside the virtual patient because you'd be you know, surrounded by all of these organs and such. So just for visualization purposes, uh, for you, she's designing it outside the body. And then once she designs the robot, she can simulate it, and she can say, okay, is the robot actually going to behave when it goes into the body in the way that I designed it for? And again, normally she would do this inside the virtual patient so she could be testing it with respect to that patient's actual anatomy. And then we print it. So uh, I kind of made it sound like, you know, this hot new 3D printing technology is what's enabling this. And it is, but it's not like this is the most expensive, fancy 3D printer. We're doing this on a MakerBot. So those of you who have ever used a 3D printer have probably heard of MakerBots. They're on the cheaper end, about $3,000 for the highest end MakerBot. And one of the standard materials that they have is called PCL, and it's a biodegradable polyester. And this kind of material is actually already used in medical devices and even in sutures. Um, so it turns out that making these robots out of PCL and printing it on a very standard cheap 3D printer is totally feasible and even relevant to actual clinical practice. So once you have your tubes, you print out the ones that the surgeon designed, and then you have to attach them to some motors that can insert and spin each tube in order to create this tentacle-like behavior. And uh, this as well doesn't have to use 3D printing, but we wanted to make this actuation system as small and lightweight and easy to move around the operating room as possible. So once again, we took advantage of 3D printing to make a really unique transmission system. We like to call it a waffle gear, where we really minimize the, su the size and shape of the transmission by having these sort of gears go over these waffle patterns in order to get the most degrees of freedom in the smallest amount of space. And this whole thing is made of plastic, so it can be very lightweight and handheld and cheap. And there's a couple pictures on the right showing different ways in which it can be held by a person or even held by another robot or a passive arm in order to be used in a medical procedure. So we put all of this together, all of these components of the actuation system, and we are looking for NIH funding in order to finish doing animal studies with this. But in the meantime, we have done this in an artificial patient. We took the same model from the CT scans we used to design the robot to then 3D print a patient and their artificial, uh, artificial tissues to represent them. And so we took that model, made an artificial patient, and then these clinical robots are currently the not autonomous. Gone. Although uh, I live in Mountain View, there are self-driving cars all over my neighborhood. We are not ready for self-driving surgical robots because uh, although the self-driving car problem is very, very difficult, there are rules of the road vision is not as occluded as it is inside the body. The, bo the body is very messy, there's manipulation of tissues, and, and the response is not well understood. So the human has to be in the loop to drive this robot. It's not operating by itself. So the same surgeon who designed the robot has an idea not only of the shape they wanted to follow, but, but how it should move along that path. 
And so that same surgeon can then use this master robot, which actually is a haptic device, uh, in order to command the positions and orientations of, of the robot inside the body. So kind of full circle, the same surgeon that designed the robot can then teleoperate it in order to control its movement inside the patient. And we've demonstrated this, um, showing that uh, in our artificial patient, we can go around ribs, we can go in at angles that would be less invasive to a patient. For example, this represents an eight-year-old with a kidney stone. And with eight-year-olds, the size of their body is such that there's no straight line path to get to the kidney stone with a needle. And so instead, we, we curve around the ribs, avoid the lungs in order to get to that target. And we've shown that we can do that in these artificial tissues. So again, it's a, it's a soft robot. And the softness that is the flexibility of the plastic in these tubes enables it to have the kind of movement capabilities that it does. But it's a very different kind of softness from the first case, where we're not really changing its stiffness, and we're not really fully changing its, its shape by blowing it up, but rather the interaction of the, tissue, of, the, the, of the tubes causes different types of bending to change the shape. The third project is kind of a, a mix of those two previous soft robots. Um, it's like the first one in that it uses pneumatics. It uses air pressure to run. But it's also like the second project in that it makes a, a long, skinny tool, and it might have applications in medicine. And this project we like to think of as, as a robot growth that's biologically inspired. And the idea is that there are many things in nature which, which grow, ranging from very small things like pollen tubes to vines, which if you're a gardener may be the bane of your existence. But for us, vines are really cool because they can climb along walls, they can get through small crevices, and they're able to do that because unlike animals which have to move their whole body, they just extend from the tip, and that tip can actually be quite tiny. So the way that we achieve this, this growth, it's not magical. We're not magically creating material at the tip. But what we are doing is we're feeding more plastic through the center of a plastic tubing. And if you're having trouble picturing mechanically how this works, if you've ever seen one of those water snake toys, they're kind of like a torus that is elongated, and they flip in and out of each other. My kids have them. They, they love them. <laughs> Fun toys. But now, instead of thinking of it as constantly rotating about itself, we just keep feeding more material through the center, and that allows it to grow, as shown in there. Now, what this allows is extremely large change in length. So unlike a, a classic snake robot, where the whole snake has to move its body, we just keep growing like a plant does. And so let me see if I can get these videos to play. So the video on the top right shows one just growing vertically against gravity until eventually it buckles and falls over. The ones on the bottom show a whole roll of this tubing that keeps getting fed out. And the right bottom video shows the end result from having just pressurized and fed this tube through. And this is just a couple PSI. I think we grew this about 70 meters. Our, our goal had been to grow at the length of the Stanford football field, and we, we pretty much got there. Uh, we only ran out of plastic. That was, I think, our, our limited issue. Uh, although it turns out you can get really big balls of these plastic, uh, really big tubes of them um, from, uh, from Amazon. So we now have a good plastic supply, and we'll never be troubled by that again. Uh, and so the cool thing is that we can grow it very, very long distances. But you might say that this is not, this is not a robot yet. It might be soft, but it's not a robot. It becomes a robot when we can actively control it. We can tell it to turn left and turn right. And so to do that, we need to have a way that it's not like putting motors and joints like with a classic robot. We have to find a way that, that at the tip it can change its mind about which direction to go. And there are two ways to think about doing that. One is a way that's permanent. And in the permanent method, we have pinches on the plastic. And when you pinch the plastic on one side, it curves towards the pinch. And if we let that pinch peel off, we let it unpinch, then it will go straight. So we can have this permanent direction change just by letting pinches unpinch when we want it to go straight. On the right-hand side is something that's a little more compl complicated, but more flexible. And that is reversible direction change, where we have multiple kind of pneumatic tendons, um, one of which is shown in the video on the right right now. 
and then we put those around the outside of the backbone of the growing robot, and those can be controlled in a reversible fashion. You can look left, you can look right, and then you can decide where to grow. And we've done this uh, with overhead cameras, as well as, on the right, having a camera that stays mounted at the tip of the growing robot. And that way, you can always look at where you're going, and uh, although in some applications, like medical, there might be other applications where having an autonomous robot is useful, so we've shown that, the, based on the camera images, we can autonomously grow to targets. And those are non-reversible methods in that video. This set of video is the same thing, but with the reversible methods. We're growing towards uh, a light using a camera mounted on the tip, and you can start to imagine now the applications where this would be, where this would be useful. So I'll give you some examples of these applications. This is like our robot gym, <laughs> showing all of, some of, the, all of the different uh, uh, actuation uh, technologies, some of them just growing, some turning, and it being able to do several interesting tasks. So the top left, it's popping through a very small hole, much smaller than its own body diameter. The middle one shows the robot going through a kind of obstacle course of going through a bath of glue and then getting punctured by some nails, and it just keeps going as it feeds more material through. On the right, along the top, is a firefighting robot, which actually grows over the fire, and then the fire melts the plastic, and then the water inside the robot puts the fire out. Cute, huh? We like that one. And then uh, the bottom one is actually really exciting because it starts to show some very simple manipulation capabilities of such a robot. So here we grew it under a door. We pre-mechanically programmed it through this non-reversible direction change to grow up and around and hook around a lever which it could turn, for example, to turn off a gas leak or something like that. So you can imagine a, a search and rescue or disaster scenario. You could get into places where people don't want to go and then do some kind of manipulation task. So this is a very new kind of soft robot, and it's just taking advantage of the flexibility of that plastic material and the pneumatic pressure to achieve these interesting behaviors. So I hope that gives you a good introduction to the kinds of things that we can do with soft robots which are very different from the traditional industry, industrial robots or even medical robots that exist on the market today. And although there is, is very few things happening commercially right now with soft robotics, I think over the next decade, you'll, you'll start to see an explosion of, of products and new research in this interesting area. And I'll end by thanking you for listening and all of my awesome students that contributed to this work. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you. And we have another one. So this is this are uh, the videos we would like to watch for today's lesson. Do you guys have any questions? So I'll be here until 3.45. If you guys got any questions, you can ask me until then. Uh, till then. And I think uh... Mohammed Rizan. I'm sorry. Uh, I think Mohammed Rizan, or no? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Antonio.
Hello, Antonio. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us, giving us this lecture today. Uh, thank you for uh, this opportunity. It was a pleasure for me. Thank okay. you. See you later. Uh, see you.